And I want to say welcome to Northville. We're going to kind of turn things around today and flip-flop uh, uh, the message and uh, the, the singing through worship today. Whether this is your first time at Northville, whether this is your 50th time at Northville, and you call Northville home, whether you're in the house, whether you're viewing online today, thank you for the gift of your time. We hope that each of you will take a moment and uh, scan the QR code in front of you to reach that digital connection card. Or if you're watching online, to hit the link in the feed. Or anyone can go to the Northville app or website and under the connections tab, click the link digital connection card. You, uh, you can tell us a little bit about who you are. If you're one of our regular members, you can say, hey, I was here today. If you have a prayer request, we would love to be praying for you. There's a place on there for that. You can volunteer too. Sir, if you made a commitment to follow Jesus, you can ask more about going public in that commitment through baptism. And I know Mike last week talked about, and thank you again, Mike, for uh, giving me a week with my family at the beach. I appreciate that. I loved listening to everyone online last week as well. And, uh, uh, but as Mike said, you can sign up to be a Northfield Life Group host on there as well and find out more about Life Groups. You can also do a little bit of good in the world this morning by checking in on Facebook or Instagram and location tagging Northfield Church. Uh, we partner with a company called Cosley. And this month, whether that's uh, today or any time this week through Inva Vacation Bible School, if you're on our premises and you check in on one of those, every check-in will provide an hour of education for a, a, an adult in an impoverished country. So you can do a little bit of good just by checking in. And then uh, last before our big thing this morning is next week is the blood drive. We are over 60% at capacity. There are about 24 more slots left. And uh, uh, you know, for those of you who, most of you know uh, what the, the situation with my grandson and uh, one of the things that gave us an extra couple of days of life with him is because people gave, gave blood. Uh, Adam McDonald, who runs our website, whose uh, dad passed away from cancer several years ago, one of the things that gave him more time with his dad throughout that process was that people gave blood. It is life-giving. And I hope that you will jump in and be a part of filling those extra 24 slots. You can do that online under the, uh, the, the tab that talks about the blood dive under the events tab. So I think, I hope you'll do that. Tonight starts what? VBS, that's right. Anybody care to guess how many kids we have registered? Over 400. Can you believe it? <laughs> Biggest group of kids we've ever, the time in our church, I see, the, I see back there the Pattersons at the Schwartz. There was a time in church we didn't have 400 people, did we? We, we didn't have a, we're looking for 100 people, and now we have 400 kids coming to Vacation Bible School this week. It's going to be great, uh, and I want to thank you, not only, you know, if you haven't registered, you can still do that today on the events tab of our Northville app or website, and you can be a part of what's going to be an incredible, incredible evening, not only tonight, but through Wednesday night of this week. Uh, but I want to thank you for the way you volunteered. You know, we, I talked to Savannah yesterday, and she said, even with this many kids, we had, uh, we had people from the very beginning that just as we needed a slot, somebody volunteered. The way you volunteered, the way you put in there, we didn't have to put out extra calls. So not only did you represent the volunteer state well, you represented your Savior well who came uh, uh, to be a servant to us. Uh, you know, in our DNA at Northville Church is uh, uh, just community and missions. It's really uh, kind of how we said if we want to be a church in Sumner County, we want to be one who is, I call it an Acts 1-8 church. It's, uh, you know, Acts 1-8 is, kind of describes how the mission work that Jesus did. He started, he told the disciples, you're going to start right here at home, but then you're going to go to community, you're going to go to your world. And uh, uh, part of VBS, the DNA of that, is going into our world. Every year we have missions. And this week, uh, we are talking about four different missions, all which stem from right here at Northfield Church. Hope Springs that does work work in Niger, Nigeria and Chad, Africa, Agape to the Nations that does work in the Dominican Republic, Haiti and Uganda, and then there's Core Foundation that does work in uh, Haiti again, and then Ali Hudson, Northfield member, who does work uh, as a missionary in Mexico. All of those, the Farbers and the Brattons with Core, uh, Lee Hodges, one of our shepherds with Hope Springs, and Charlie and Kinsley Smith with Agape to the Nations. So your children are going to have a chance to be a part of hearing about some of those during, the, uh, during this week and being able to give back because we want that DNA to not just be a part of what uh, we as adults do, but part of what our kids do. 
So I would encourage you, we're asking every child and every adult that comes who can uh, to bring seven bucks. And uh, you can bring it and you can give it there with your child uh, uh, any night this week. Or you can go online with your child if you want to. And you can push the VBS missions button. But that will allow us to make a difference, allow your children. I would encourage even, you know, in light of the, the message that we had a couple of weeks ago about not building up treasures on earth, but building up treasures in heaven, uh, to be a part of helping your child. Maybe, maybe it's an extra chore. Maybe it's a little job that you can give them. Maybe it's a lemonade stand uh, where they could help raise seven bucks some way and then learn what it's like to turn around and pray over that and then be able to give that. Uh, so uh, if, if we all do that, I know you got an email that said eight bucks, but that was before we had over 400 people registered. Now we have over 400 people. It's seven, so 600 people come tonight, it might be down to six bucks. Who knows? Uh, <laughs> We're just going to go there. Anyway, uh, today we are beginning the end. Notice I didn't say ending, but we are beginning to end this upside down series that's been about uh, this first and most famous sermon of Jesus called the Sermon on the Mount. It's found in Matthew's chapter, Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7, and today we are beginning chapter 7. And remember when Matthew first gave this uh, or wrote these words down, there were no chapters and verses like we had today. It was just one letter written to the Jewish people. And as chapter 7 opens up, our chapter 7, it is really just a continuation of what's been going on in chapter 6, what Jesus has been saying. His message about how kingdom people live. If you remember from chapter 6, Jesus has given them some spiritual disciplines, or as he calls them, acts of righteousness that he assumes his followers will take up in their life. Things like praying. So he says, when you pray. He assumes his followers will be people who fast. So he says, when you fast. There will be people who give. He says, so when you give. There are just things that people who are kingdom people do. That help identify and describe them. And then in the middle of chapter 6, he kind of reminds us of some things or behaviors. Uh, not that kingdom people do, but that kingdom people try to push out of their lives and, and get rid of. Things like kingdom people don't store up treasures where? On earth, that's right, they store up treasures in heaven. Kingdom people don't try to serve two masters. They have a heart and a throne for one. Kingdom people, as Mike said last week, they don't have a heart of worry and anxiety about what they're going to eat or wear or even about tomorrow. They live kingdom lives learning to trust in the king for those things. And that's where chapter 6 ends. And chapter 7 opens up with that same theme of continuing to talk about behaviors that kingdom people try to push out of their lives. Not only do they replace worry with faith, kingdom people also replace judgment with love. You may have heard the story about the business owner who was born with no ears. He could hear, but he had no ears. Uh, and in his business, there comes a time when he needs some help. So he begins to advertise that he has a job opening. He begins to interview people. But he's very cautious about who he interviews because he wants somebody because he has a very visible, uh, I don't know if you would call it disability, but something that's very visible that's different about him. And uh, he, doesn't, uh, he, he wants somebody who's sensitive to people who may come into his business and have things about them that may them look different. So he's very cautious about who he's talking to. A young lady comes in to interview. She goes through the interview. She does pretty well in the interview. And at the end, uh, he gets uh, uh, down to it. And he, and he says, well, one last thing I want to ask before you leave. Uh, did you notice anything about me? Well, she kind of quickly and rather harshly and firmly said, yeah, I noticed that you don't have any ears. And he said, well, you're right, but that's pretty harsh. And I'm trying to hire somebody who, you know, is a little bit kinder, who just doesn't put it out there right at the beginning. Well, uh, next, a young man comes in for an interview. And at the, interview, the, at the end of the interview, the business owner asks the same questions. Well, did you notice anything about me? Young man kind of flippantly said, yeah, man, I, I did. You ain't got no ears. I tried not to stare, but it was hard. I mean, I was looking the whole time. You must have noticed that I was staring. He said, oh, yeah, I noticed that you were staring. And, and I'm really trying to find somebody who that's not the first thing they noticed. Well, pretty soon a third person came in for an interview. And it was a good interview. And at the end, the business owner again asked the young lady who was there in front of him. and said, well, did you notice something about me? And she goes, well, uh -uh. was I supposed to? Like, is there something? He goes, he goes, so you didn't notice anything? And she goes, well, I, you know, I came in for an interview. And the business owner thought in his heart, well, you know, she's probably the one. I, I, I kind of like her. He said, he said, but I'm going to give her one more chance. So he says, now look, look, look very, look very intently. So the young lady, she stepped back and she looked, looked down across. She said, she even squinted her eyes and said, 
yeah, I do notice something. You're, you're wearing contacts. <laughs> and he said, that's right. How did you know? She goes, well, you have no ears. You can't be wearing glasses. <laughs> Uh, and don't you love those people who the biggest thing you've got going on is not the first thing that they see or, or at least call out, which may lead us into what Jesus is saying in Matthew chapter 7, verse 1, where he begins to open up the dialogue with these words, do not judge, which just might be the most quoted scripture among two groups of people, those who follow Jesus and those who don't. And probably among both groups of people, most of them will be saying, I think the Bible says that in there somewhere. There's, I don't know. I don't have a clue where it is. But there is something in the Bible that says, do not judge. Well, now you know where it is. Matthew 7, verse 1. First sermon that Jesus gave. And James, the brother of Jesus in his book, is going to repeat the very same thing. Most people don't know where it is. Now you do. We just know that it's in there. And everybody likes to quote it. And to be honest with yourself, it's a very handy scripture to know. Especially if you want to do your own thing in your own way, and not have anybody say anything about what you're doing. You can always come up with, well, the Bible says, do not judge. So guess what, dude? You ain't the judge of me. And isn't it ironic that people who don't even believe the Bible will pull this out of the Bible and use it? And isn't it confusing that people who do believe the Bible will use it in a way that is really not the way Jesus intended. Let's see if we can clear up uh, some of what Jesus is saying when he starts out by this phrase, do not judge. In our modern American culture, uh, the way this verse is most popularly, if that's the word, the most popular use for this verse in our language is this. It, it is that you and I have no right to tell anyone how to live their lives. That's basically what most people mean in our day and age when they say, don't judge. You have no right to tell me what to do. You, I'll, I'll do what I want to do in my life. You do what you want to do with your life. I'll do you, me. You do you. You don't even have the right to disagree with what I do or say because you have no right to, what's the word? Judge me. And you know how I know? Because the Bible tells me so. So let's read the entire passage of Scripture together and see if we can determine what Jesus is saying by this most often quoted and misused verse in Scripture. Starting in verse 1. Do not judge, or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the same measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in someone else's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say, whoop, where did you go? <laughs> How can you say, <laughs> stay with me, <laughs> let me take this back out of your eye when all the time there's a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the plank out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from the other person's eye. And then he ends with verse 6. Do not give dogs what is sacred. Do not throw your pearls to pigs. If you do, they may trample them under their feet and then turn and tear you to pieces. Now, what I want to do is start with that verse because that verse seems very judgmental, doesn't it? I mean, you're just reading it right offhand. You've got Jesus starts out with do not judge. And by the time he gets to verse 6, you're thinking, well, that seems like a very judgmental statement. Do not give to dogs what is sacred and do not throw your pearls to pigs. Now, when you read that, we read that with our modern American picture of a dog and a pig. We read that thinking of this. <laughs> Where when Jesus said it, he was talking about this. That's kind of a different story, isn't it? We think puffy and Jesus is thinking Cujo. And then, you know, this is how it kind of goes. So when you do that, and you can take that, for, you can take that off of there for now. I don't want to look at that when I go there. In those days, uh, and, 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 and any time you're trying to interpret a, a text that's difficult or a, a text that maybe seems to contradict something else, the best way to interpret Scripture is with Scripture itself. The best way to interpret Scripture is to ask yourself, who was the Scripture written to? And in what context was Jesus saying this? And in their day, in their age... Uh, 
uh, people did not have pet dogs. Uh, dogs were scavengers. They ran around. Often in those cultures, they even ate dogs. They carried disease. Dogs and pigs, pigs especially, were considered unholy to the Jewish people. But in a lot of Arabic cultures, dogs were considered unholy as well. You would never find a Jewish home that would, that would have a Vietnamese pot belly pig in their home. They just they would, they would not be doing that. And you would never find a, a home, really, Jewish or anyone in their day and age, who would have what they would consider a ravenous dog in their home. It would be unsafe. And so when Jesus says, you don't give what is holy to dogs and you don't give pearls to pigs, you know, the dog will never treat what is holy, holy. Well, because it's not made that way. The, pearl will, the, the pig will never take a pearl and make it a necklace. Why? Because the pig and the dog, they don't value what you value. They don't treasure what you treasure. And the context here is not modern America. It's ancient Israel. And you would never think about taking the meat that was offered in temple sacrifices and then letting the dogs just ravage it and trample it and tear it apart. And I think the point Jesus is making is, and I reserve the right to be wrong, but I don't think he's calling a specific person or group of people pigs or dogs. Some people do. I happen not to think that. I think he's looking on this occasion as he's preaching this to the hillsides and the country that are there around Galilee. And he sees what would have been wild pigs. And he sees what would have been wild dogs. And he says, don't take these things that you treasure and waste them on things or things that, that, that will never treasure what you treasure. Um, really, this, is the, this verse here is really a short parable. A parable is a, an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. And oftentimes in Scripture, especially when we have longer parables, we, would, we like to do things. We like to say, okay, uh, the pig is this, and the dog is this, and the pearl is this. And you try to find a direct one-to-one -one correlation between those things. But oftentimes in Scripture, you can't do that. Sometimes, especially when you have little short parables, the uh, verse, I think it was four that we read, why do you take Take the plank out of, uh, why do you try to take the speck out of your brother's eye when all the time you've got a plank in your own eye? First, take the plank out of your eye, then you can see clearly to get the speck out of your brother's eye. That's another short parable that Jesus is telling. I don't think you can look at that and say, well, this is the plank and this is the speck and this is the dust and this is the person he's talking to. I think what he's doing, he's, he's talking in principles here. And sometimes we can miss the point of what Jesus is saying by trying to ascribe to every detail in there. Think what he is, uh, in the end, he is saying. There are, there are people, there are situations in your life that don't treasure what you treasure. Even Jesus himself said, there are times when I, when I shake the dust. He even told his disciples, when you come across people, I don't make people follow me. So if you come across people who, who, are, who are like, I don't think he's calling them that. I think he's saying, who are like that, they're never going to treasure the word that you've hidden in your heart. You're not to force it on them. It's not your business to be the one that tries to make them conform to your behavior. Let them be what they're going to be. You treasure what you need to treasure. Anyway, that's my short, take it for what it's worth, commentary on that verse. Let's back up and let's start uh, at verse 1 going forward. All of that begins uh, with these words of Jesus. Do not judge. And to be honest, it doesn't feel good when you feel judged, does it? I don't think anyone likes that. And perhaps the number one thing that, that I hear, maybe you hear it as well in Christianity, things that drive people away from Christianity, is often non-Christians feel that Christians can be judgmental and sometimes narrow-minded. Have, have any, has anyone ever heard anyone say that? I, I see a lot of head shaking yes there. And again, if we are honest with ourselves, aren't we all, and I'm going to put us all in a boat here, Christian and non-Christian alike, aren't we all a bit judgmental? I think sometimes it's human nature to be that way. We observe someone's behavior. We look at their appearance. We look at the way they talk or maybe the way they act or maybe the way they dress. And we make a judgment about them. Several of our young adults were uh, at our home last night. And uh, the subject of tattoos came up because every one of them had a tattoo. And uh, like when I was their age, nobody that was my age or their age I knew of had a tattoo. And uh, we were looking at it and, and my wife just 
Flippant Lee said, you know, they said, you need to get a tattoo, Linda. And she was like, I don't think I get it. I don't think they look good when you're old. To which my son would say, we're already old. So anyway, I don't know that it matters. But, but uh, one of the young ladies that were there said, well, you know, everybody, everybody our age has a tattoo. So when we get old, we're all going to look bad together. And uh, we all laughed about that. And I thought, you know, in, when I was growing up, I remember being, being a teenager. The only person, only people who had tattoos were who? Sailors and prisoners. That was right. If somebody had a... <laughs> If somebody had a tattoo, they were either fresh out of the Navy or fresh out of prison. You didn't know which one they are. So, you know, you kind of stayed away from them there. But we made judgments based, you know, on what somebody looked at out there. And today, it's not hard. You see someone, you, you observe them, you look at them, and, and all of a sudden, by the way they dress or act, you think gang member. Or you think future prisoner, or you think gay or straight, or you see somebody who does or doesn't discipline the way you do, and you think bad mom, good mom, bad dad, good dad. You know, uh, you see somebody in maybe an action or maybe a belief that they have about something leads you to think Democrat, Republican. We see someone and their behavior, and instead of seeing their dignity, now, now I'm going to say something that I hope you don't have any pushback on, but if you do, stay with me. You see somebody, you see their behavior, and instead of seeing their dignity, and here's the part, whether you like or dislike or agree or disagree with the behavior is going to be irrelevant to the point Jesus is making. We say that at the very beginning. You see someone doing something, you like it, you don't like it, however you feel about it, their behavior is going to become irrelevant to what Jesus is saying when he says, do not judge. We see somebody, whether we like or dislike their behavior, uh, we tend to, if we're not careful, write them off. And they become, well, that person. Or you put them in a category, those people. Or you know their type, their type. That's just their type. We put them in a category. And without realizing it, we almost draw a line. And we put them over here, but where am I? Well, I'm over here. And the reason we get a bad rap is that we begin to give the implication that who's over here with me? Jesus. And here's me and Jesus. And all of a sudden, I'm acting or living or thinking in a way that when people are looking at me, they think I have pitted me and Jesus against the people on this side of the line. Or the people I perceive to be on this side of the line. And what I think Jesus is teaching or going to teach in this uh, short six verses that we have read is that, is that is not the way he wants people who belong to the kingdom of God to behave or to act to anyone, let alone to each other. So what does Jesus mean when he says, do not judge? Some people read that and they say that, well, Christians aren't to make any evaluations about anything or any kind. We can't say anything good or we can't say anything bad about anyone's behavior or actions or we can't be critical in any way. Is, do you think that's what Jesus means? Well, if it is what Jesus means, he breaks his own law in verse 15. Because by the time you get to verse 15, Jesus is going to look and he's going to tell the people, beware of false prophets. Now, how do I know who's a false prophet? Well, I've got to make a judgment about him, don't I? I've got to make an evaluation about them. I've got to determine something. And how do we usually do that? How do we usually make determinations about that? Well, it's usually, isn't it, by the way that they act, what they say, what they do. All of those things come into play. Even in, uh, uh, when I get to the Old Testament prophet of Elijah, he spoke powerfully against King Ahab and Queen Jezebel and how they were leading. And if we take don't judge to mean that we can't call out bad behavior, then the prophet Elijah broke the commandment of God not to judge. Or Paul in the New Testament, when, when uh, people are trying to come to Christ and the Judaizers, as he calls them, or the people who are teaching that to come to Jesus, you've got to go through Moses first. And Paul has some harsh words for those people. Well, if Jesus really meant, Paul, you can't give harsh words. You can't call out people who are teaching something that's wrong. If you can't do that, then, they, then Paul broke this command not to judge. In Galatians 6, Paul says, if any one of you is overtaken in a fault, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of meekness. Well, to do that, you kind of have to make an evaluation, don't you, about, well, what is the fault and what are they overcome with? Or if I could take it away from Scripture 
and just bring it to now. Think about it this way. If don't judge means that I can't say anything or speak out about anyone's behavior or what anyone wants to do, then I've got some questions. Can a teacher really correct a student or grade a paper without breaking that law? Because it's her judgment, isn't it? It's his judgment as a teacher. Can a police officer pull you over? Do they have the right to make a judgment about the way you are driving? Can a jury render a verdict, dare I say judgment, about whether a person has committed a criminal or civil act? If I can't say anything about what you believe or write, then someone, in a, a professor who would assign you a paper to write, do they have the right then to judge the quality of that paper at the end? Or take this. More controversial. Our, so, our culture says that we don't have the right to tell anyone who they can sleep with. Don't judge me. Let me ask you, do you think that applies if a 34-year-old man wants to sleep with a 14-year-old girl? I mean, don't judge me. Don't judge my behavior. I'll do me, you do you. And if you believe maybe I'll do you and you do me if that's right, would it change your mind if the 14 or 13-year-old girl is your 14 or 13-year-old daughter? And if don't judge means we can't make any determination or decision or question behavior, do you even have the right to tell your 10, 11, or 12, or 13-year-old son or daughter how to act? You see, I think if we think about it, I think on some level we would all agree that there are things and there are places and there are environments where we are allowed to make a determination, make an evaluation, dare I say, judge something that's right or wrong. The Greek word for judge that Jesus uses is the word krino. Krino. And krino has several definitions. Uh, two that are very, that are very known in, in our day and age. And then a third one, which is the way in which I think Jesus is using this word when he says, do not judge. And in fact, we'll see in a minute, that's not all Jesus says. That's just the beginning. Uh, one of those definitions of krino is this, to decide. So if when Jesus says, do not judge, is he saying that you can't decide? Well, the answer has to be no, because if the answer is yes, you can't make a decision, then you can't get to verse 6 or to verse 15 without breaking that law already. And we make decisions all the time, don't we? All of you are going to get in your car today, and you're going to say, where do you want to go to lunch? And the other person is going to say, I don't care, where do you want to go to lunch? And the other person is say, I don't care, where do you want to go to lunch? And the minute you say where you want to go to lunch, they're going to say, well, I don't want to go to lunch there. You're going <laughs> to, I've had the conversation. I know exactly what's going to happen. You're making a decision. Is it Chinese or is it Mexican? You're going to decide, is it Pelicans tonight for dessert or crumble cookie? Is it, you know, do I buy this shirt or that shirt? Or, hey, they're on sale, buy them both. You know, we make decisions all the time. So it's pretty clear that maybe Making a decision about something that's not what Jesus is talking about when he says don't judge. Second definition that was widely used even in the days of Jesus for this word crino and in our day and age as well is to judge but not judge in the way that you and I maybe are thinking in the negative sense. Uh, this judge as in a person who has gone to law school or they have gone through the qualifications and they sit and preside over a case and they make a judgment. Most of the people in our society would say that our society works because we have judges that do that and they, and they keep things in, in some semblance of order. Uh, you could boil it down a little bit further into something that's maybe not that uh, um, wonderful of anxiety, not to, maybe that, not that serious. Uh, how many of you watch American Idol? Anybody? Nobody watches American Idol but me. Like, oh, uh, uh, how many of you watch America's Got Talent? Does anybody watch TV? <laughs> <laughs> I think so. Well, you know, all of those shows, what do they have? They have a panel. Oh, I know. Y'all watch The Voice, don't you? Is that what it is? Oh, yeah, there it is. They, have, they got the chairs turned around. Well, even the people in the chairs turned around, what are they doing? They're making a judgment. They're making an evaluation as to how well you, you know, dance, sing, juggle, or whatever it is that you do. So there is a sense in which that word judge is actually positive, even though we can think about it as negative. Or take the police officer uh, example that I have for a minute. I might, I might want to say, you have no right to judge me by pulling me over. But the other drivers on the road may not agree with that. Those of you who have children that are learning to drive, aren't you glad that 
there are police officers who are trying to find and pull over people who are swerving and going all over the road. You know the only person who doesn't like that the police officer used a judgment against you when you're driving? That's right. It's when you're the one driving. That you, that's the only time you really have a problem. Any other time you're like, yeah, get them, you know, pull them over. They needed it. And, and isn't it, you know, well, I already said that. Anyway, go ahead. And the third way, uh, so, so that word is not necessarily positive. So when Jesus says do not judge, he's not talking about that either. Because that's all throughout scripture. It was in their day and age. It's in our day and age as well. The third way in which Jesus uses this word or which this word is used in scripture is a way that destroys relationships. And if you read the Sermon on the Mount, the Sermon on the Mount is all about how to live as kingdom people. It's a sermon built on relationships in this community of faith that we share with each other. The short definition of the third way Crino is used is this, is to condemn. To condemn. It is longer definition. It is a harsh, self-righteous judgment on the character of another person based on their actions or behavior with a critical evaluation that assumes, this is a key word, assumes to know the motive of the person. You can see what I do. What you can't always see is the heart behind what I do. And isn't it true that sometimes we make judgments about people and judgments uh, about situations and we don't have all the facts Two very light examples. You see someone at a restaurant. Maybe it's someone that you've helped in life. Maybe it's someone that you've helped pay an electric bill or something for. And you go to a restaurant. And it's a nice restaurant that would take a little bit of money to eat at. And you see them eating there. And and in your mind, isn't it pretty easy to say, well, why in the world would they be eating here? I mean, I had to pay their electric bill not long ago. And And maybe you have assumed something. Maybe you don't know that while you pay their electric bill, somebody else wanted to bless them and give them a good certificate. I mean, they could, very, they could very well be there because uh, uh, it may be the very reason they're struggling. It's because they're eating there and they should be a crystal. I don't know. That, that, that could be the reason. The point, again, is not the behavior, is it? The point is how we react to the behavior. The point is how we treat the person. You call somebody at noon one day because you need to talk with them only to discover that they're in bed. But then you hang up and you think, they must be lazy. They're sleeping all day. Maybe they work at night. It's a harsh judgment you make assuming to know the facts when in reality you don't know the facts. One of the books that uh, I read several years ago, um, it was right after we moved into this building here and we were thinking about Sumner Center and and, and, and how do we treat the people who are coming in and, and maybe they need food or maybe they need dental work or whatever it is. And, and, and often, you know, they don't have the same values that I might have a, as a person. They, they, they're a little bit different than I do. And I remember reading in this book, Breaking the Broken, and it, it talked about uh, uh, two different scenarios. It talked about a young man who grew up from the time that he, that he was an infant. He grew up in a home with a single mom on the wrong side of town. And all he ever saw, the way their family got money, is once a week, that mother, or once a month, that mother would walk to the mailbox and got a check. There was no one in their house. There was never a guy. There was never really not even a mom who was there who, who exemplified the principle of, of working for what you get. Now, now, I could make a judgment about that person, couldn't I? I could look at them later on in life and what if they're still living that way? And maybe I make a judgment about them not knowing their circumstances because I'm going to tell you, a kid that is raised and for the first 18 years of their life, the only way they saw that a check came into their home was mom or dad walked to a mailbox and get it. It's not right, but, but it, it hard, it's hardwired in their brain. They think differently. Every psychologist will tell you that. Then growing up in a home where my son or daughter saw a a, a dad who got up and went to work, or, or maybe in your home saw a mom who got up and went to work every day, they think differently. So Jesus says, don't make judgments about people before you know the circumstances. Don't assume to know the motive. You may only know the stupid action. And I'm not saying it's even right to sit at home and not work. What I'm saying is don't make a judgment about that person that treats them harshly when you don't know the circumstances from which they came. And it's not even saying, don't even try to fix what's wrong because you're going to see that all of this is not an admonition not to fix something that we see that's wrong in other people. It's an admonition to be very careful that we don't practice judgment without love. 
that those two things, that just as last week, that we, that we try to push worry out of our life and we try to push faith into our life, that in this scenario, what we try to do is push judgment out of our life and we try to push love into our lives in the way that we deal with people. Jesus uh, dealt with people who were self-righteous all of their life. And, and when you see that word self-righteous, it's, it's a person who tries to consistently fix other people without fixing themselves. And that's what people did with Jesus. If you look around, the religious leaders today, they are constantly picking on him. He eats with the wrong people. He heals with the wrong day. He touches the wrong people. He tells the wrong people what to do at the wrong time. If there was something they could find wrong about Jesus, they, they did it. They put Jesus, they put themselves here, and they put Jesus over here. And all of a sudden, what they did, then they got to where they not only looked at his behavior, you hit on the wrong day, you touched the wrong people, all this stuff. Then they started talking about his motives. You even do it not because you follow God, but they attributed his healing and his love for other people to the power of Satan. Isn't it strange that when you begin to develop a heart that wants to assume things about people, you can even get to the point where you can see somebody doing something good and attribute that to the power of Satan instead of the power of God in their lives. And they do that without looking at themselves. They can spot your mess a while a ways off, but they can't spot their mess when it's right under their nose. I wonder how many marriages have ended because of petty fault finding. Because I kept looking at what was wrong with you and I never addressed what was wrong with me. I wonder how many parents are alienated from their son or daughter because of the person their son or daughter chose to marry. And they, they caused such a friction there. Or alienated from their children because, of, because their children felt they could never really get it right with mom or dad. It's assuming to know the heart and the mode of another person. And Jesus is saying, you can see the behavior. And I'm not talking about the behavior. I'm not agreeing that it's right or wrong. I, you know, it's irrelevant to what I'm saying. What I'm saying is this. You don't need to be judging the motive behind that. You don't need to let the behavior go, but you don't judge the person based on the behavior. And the warning of Jesus is for those whose general response is to make a judgment before knowing the facts. Those who tend to shoot first and ask questions later. If you've been to Starting Point, you know that one of our values is this. We, we tell people, we would like for you to develop an attitude where you believe the best about other people and not assume the worst. To not go into situations, I wonder how many marriages, how many relationships would be better if I assumed that when you hurt me, and instead of the first thing that coming out of my mouth is, well, you know, I, they meant to do that. What if I believe the best? What, what, if I, what if I chose to believe, you know, they didn't mean to do that. It, it did hurt me. I'm not denying that it hurt me. But what if I assumed, tried to believe the best about them and instead of assuming the worst about them. Because what Jesus knows is that a spirit that assumes the worst is a spirit that destroys people and community. With that background, notice this verse again, do not judge. And most people end there, but that's not where Jesus ends. <laughs> he goes on and he says, do not judge or you too will be judged. Do not have this harsh self righteous judgment or you're going to be judged too. Do you know what he just said there 2,000 years before karma became popular? Karma was popular. Jesus said, I want you to know something. What goes around comes around. And this is the way he's going to say it. Look at the next verse. He says, for in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Jesus had two ways that he could judge people. He could judge people with justice. You get what's coming to you. How many of you want what's coming to you? Well, there's a worldly sort of way. When you work for it, you kind of want something that's coming for you. But spiritually speaking, let me tell you, you don't want what's coming to you. Because Jesus took what was coming to you and what was coming to me on the cross. We don't want what was coming to us. We want mercy. So Jesus says, you know, on that day when, when you stand before me, when you want me to look at you and, and, and to judge, how do you want me to judge? With grace? With mercy? Or with justice? And if you want mercy on that day, then could you be a person that shows mercy in your day? Could you do for other people what I do for you? So before you decide to judge someone harsh, it would be good to ask yourself a couple of questions. Do I want to be judged by the way I'm judging? Do I want the same measure used on me? Do I want to judge other people with justice or mercy? Jesus continues. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in someone else's eye? And you read that and you're almost like, yes, yes. Jesus agrees with me. There was something wrong with them. 
Look at that. He says it. Why do you look at the speck? I mean, he had said, yeah, there was a speck in the other person's eye. And you're like, great. You and I are together on this, Jesus. We agree. There was something wrong with them. And Jesus says, you are exactly right, Tom. There was something wrong with them. You know why? Because there's something wrong with everybody. Look at what he says. Yeah, the next part of that. And pay no attention to the plank in your own eye. Yeah, I'm agreeing with you. There is something wrong with them. But guess what? They're not on this side of the line by themselves. Why? Because you're on this side of the line too. You see, when you pit Jesus here and me over here with him and everybody else over here, Jesus says, that's, that's not really the way it works. You see, the people on this side of the line are the people with the speck and the people with the plank. You have to remember that you both stood in the same position at one time. And it's not you and Jesus against this side. It's Jesus stepping across to this side and bringing us both. So all of a sudden we have the opportunity to take up the work of Jesus. And to help bring people from this side to this side. You see, Jesus is saying you better be careful in how you approach other people. Don't draw lines in the sand there. Verse 4. How can you say, let me take the speck out of your eye when all the time there's a plank in your own eye? And that would probably have been a humorous statement. The, pro the people probably would have laughed because the, the picture that Jesus was painting for them is me going and trying to take something out of your eye, a little speck, and I've got this huge log, and, you know, and every time I'm going back, I'm whacking you this way and that way with this log that's sticking out, and I'm looking for this little thing. And maybe he's saying, the reason you can't see the little thing is because you never dealt with you, Tom. You never dealt with you. There's this human propensity to judge others more harshly than we judge ourselves. It's like wearing bifocals, spiritual bifocals. And through the bottom that's meant for this close-up stuff, well, we see the close-up stuff. And it doesn't look nearly as messy as the stuff I see through the top part because that's when I begin to see everybody else. And it plays out in our life like this. We take the same characteristic, but it just wears better on me than it does on you. I am firm in my decision making. But you are hard-headed. Did you know that? Well, I reconsider my options. You, on the other hand, went back on your word. I sometimes focus on several things at work. I have the ability to multitask. You, however, pay no attention to what's going on. Parents, kids, I accidentally spilt my drink. You need to be more careful. I have been known to go in excess of the speed limit and move into the faster lane at times when it's appropriate. You, buddy, I need to talk with what more I gave you your license. You are changing lanes and switching back and forth. My children, well, they are active and they can get a little bit loud at times. Your children have a discipline problem and are going to wind up in juvenile court if you don't do something <laughs> about it. Your children will probably have a tattoo. That's what's going to happen. <laughs> and now mine does. Anyway, that's all. <laughs> I, don't, I won't tell you which one. Y'all have to find that out. And that's how these bifocals work. We tend to judge others more harshly than we do ourselves. We see our faults through a different lens. We tend to give ourselves grace and the benefit of the doubt. And I question your motives, which leads us to the real teaching, which is in verse 6, you hypocrite. And again, when you see hypocrite, don't think of Jesus in, in the same way in our 20th century or 21st century, whatever century we're in right now. Don't think of it in that. Think of it uh, when he says the word hypocrite, he really means actor. He says, he, he says you're acting when you do that. You're acting. Don't be an actor first. And anytime there's a first, there's always a what? A second. He says, first, take the plank out of your own eye, and then here's second. See, he doesn't say you don't help the person. He says, you, first, you take a good look here, and then you will see more clearly. You see, when you work on this stuff with God, it just gives you this vision to see more clearly how to remove. You see, it's not the removing. It's often how we remove that make people think we're judgmental. When we talk about their motives and their heart. To remove the speck from the other person's eye. I'm going to invite the band back up. Because we're going to end in uh, worship today. And while they're doing. The moral of the story is not. Leave the speck in your brother's eye alone. The moral of the story is to get rid of the plank in your own eye. And then go lovingly to your brother. You see it was never wrong to go to your brother or sister. And say could we talk. Are you struggling with something. I want to help. 
We all need that person in our life that we allow to come into our lives that will help us on this journey, that will call us out. Because oftentimes, you know who's the last person to see the plank? The person in whose eye the plank is. It's so easy for me to look and see what's wrong with everybody else and sometimes not consider what's wrong with myself. Jesus is about to make one of the most famous statements he will ever make. Do to others as you would have them do to you. Treat other people the way you want to be treated, which means this. I have to treat them with love. And love is not a matter of agreeing with them on everything. It is a matter of learning how to love someone who, as Jesus says, does have something wrong. And the way you do that is this. You first look and examine yourself. But that doesn't mean I ignore them. You see, the golden rule will require me to love them. And while love will not let me condemn them, love will neither let me walk away from them. Because it's not loving to let someone go in a, in a, in a direction that's going to destroy their marriage and destroy their home and destroy their children. And not come along beside them in the spirit of meekness. Maybe that's why Jesus started this whole sermon with blessed are those who are pure in heart. Blessed are those who are peacemakers. Blessed are those who are meek. Because it's the not in the pointing out. It's in the way that we point out. It's in the trying to fix them without working on me. Which I think is why Jesus said examine yourself first. I don't know if you got one of these on the way in. If you didn't. Uh, some people are coming down the aisle now and you'll raise your hand and they'll give you one but it's, uh, it's a, a little cup of juice and it's a cup of bread and you know what it says every time I break, uh, take this cup and take this bread it is an announcement to the world that I have messed up because you see it's the cup and it's the bread of forgiveness the only one in the world who had the right to judge me harshly the only one in the world who had the right to condemn me chose instead to die for me. And every time I take this bread, I, I am saying to God, God, it was never me and you over here against them. It was really me and them over here together. And you were here and what you did instead of judging harshly, instead of condemning, you stepped across the line with us and you died for us. And together you sought to pull us back in this direction. So as you take the bread this morning, I hope that you will remember that the one who could condemn didn't. As you pull back that second layer and you take the cup which represented the blood that he shed for us. It's a remembrance that the one who could have made us pay the price for our sin paid the price himself for our sin. It's remembering and it's being thankful for a God who could have but chose not to. It's not unloving to talk to people. It is unloving to talk to people in ways that are hurtful, in ways that cry out and seek to assume you know their motives when you don't. You first work on yourself and then you go lovingly to them. Maybe it's why Jesus came full of both grace and truth. Truth, you know, grace, if you give a load of truth without grace, it makes us judgmental. And maybe that's the why John said he came first full of grace because if you have a lot of grace for other people well often it makes the truth that you're about to tell them a little bit easier to swallow when you're walking beside them Father I thank you I thank you for the way that you love us Father you loved us through our messiness and I thank you Father for the ways that we're going to worship you in just a moment Father, I, I pray the words of the song we sing. I was a wretch. I remember who I was. I was lost. I was blind. I was running out of time. Sin separated. The breach was far too wide, but from the far side of the chasm, you held me in your side, and you made a way across the great divide, left behind heaven's throne to build it here inside. And there, 
at the cross. You paid the debt I owed, broke my chains, freed my soul. And for the first time, I had hope. Father, may we be and do that for the people you bring into our lives every day. And the whole church at Northville said amen. Thank you.